I remember the first time I read the script Greenland, it really struck a chord with me because what I loved about it, it was really about humanity. Yes, it's about this huge spectacle of a comet to hit the Earth, be the next extinction event um, on the planet Earth, but really it was a look at humanity from the inside out and about this family um, who are in turmoil and in crisis themselves, uh, trying to find their, their sea legs again and a marriage that is failing, um, trying to atone and solidify the family relationship with their seven-year-old son. And then this cataclysmic event happens that puts them on the run of them refining their love and refining each other. And at the core, though, what I loved about Greenland um, as, a, as a concept is it was really about how we test ourselves when it's about life or death and the things of struggle that we, that we face. Will we become selfless or will we become selfish, you know, in our, in our own, um, and face our own fears and what we're capable of? If you look at the movies that I've done in the past, they're always about morality. They're always about the gray of humanity. They're never black and white stories. They're about a protagonist or even sometimes the antagonist being pushed to a point of no reverse. They either have to make a decision to go left or to go right and both have consequences. And those are the things that excite me. And that is what Greenland is full of, is when it's life or death, will we help each other and rise to the occasion or will we become selfish and, do hein and be capable of heinous things, things that we would never think our own moral compass would be capable of. I love the structure of this movie because it's not your typical disaster movie. Instead of worrying about this big monster that's about to come hit the earth, we actually open the movie with a, with a family that's in crisis. We find out Gerard Butler's character and Raina Baccarin's character are very close to divorce. He's moving back into the house for the first time in six months. They have a little boy that's seven years old and they think they have all the time in the world to find their love again and to find atonement for their family. In the meantime, there's this um, comet, Clark, that is gonna be the closest flyby in history of planet Earth. And everybody sees it as the next Super Bowl event. They're gonna have watch parties, people are excited. So as we see this beautiful thing transpire through the, um, through the first act of the movie, the real crux of the story is actually the crisis of this family trying to find their sea legs again and to atone and, and come back together as one until suddenly this thing that's supposed to be this beautiful shiny thing that's gonna fly by the earth actually starts to enter the atmosphere and starts hitting the earth in fragments and causing massive devastation. And suddenly it becomes this family going on the run to seek shelter and, um, and save themselves, but also incur, um, encounter all of these people along the way who are also trying to, to find safety. When we started researching comets and asteroids and other extraterrestrial things um, that are out there in the universe, we found out that a lot of times these things will start as a single body but they'll hit other things along the way in their orbits and suddenly break into hundreds, if not thousands of fragments. And it was a really cool way to have this comet where they at first think it's a single body, but not, it's actually made up of hundreds of fragments that suddenly get sucked into the Earth's orbit and suddenly start pelting the Earth at any given time. So as our family is trying to seek safety and get to Greenland and to this bunker, you constantly have things that hit the earth. So you get this excitement and this big visceral thrill ride all the way through the movie versus waiting for this impact to happen at the very end. The interesting thing about Greenland is I really see it as a monster movie. You know, Clark is, uh, as the, uh, this comet that at first is supposed to be this beautiful shiny thing that's gonna fly by Earth, the closest and ever in history. Everybody's having Super Bowl parties until they realize things change trajectory and it starts to enter the atmosphere and starts to pelt the Earth in fragments that the monster is here and now it's this thing that they're running from. But what's really interesting about the storyline and I loved about the script is there's really two monsters in the movie. It's not only the monster Clark, but it's a humanity itself very much of what we're going through in this pandemic right now, where suddenly it's about what will humanity do? 
Will we turn on each other or will we help each other in need? And I love stories like that. I love stories that ch test people's morality, that move into the gray of society of what am I capable of for survival? How far would I go? Both Gerard Butler's character, both Anne Marina Baccarin's character are tested in this way. And they encounter people that are normal everyday human beings who are also trying to save themselves that you wonder, are they going to do the right thing and act selfless and help our family? Or are they going to do heinous things? things that they wouldn't even think were conscionable before they're put into a life or death situation. So for me, what I love about Greenland is you get two monsters in one. You get this big visceral movie of a comet pelting the earth and the devastation that happens with that. But you also have humanity itself. Will we become the monster or will we actually become the savior to our own selves? There's some really great themes in this movie about atonement and redemption. Um, Gerard Butler's character has a secret, you know, of something that, that happened in this marriage and something that he is trying to atone for and, to rede uh, and find redemption for and also feeling up to, or live, living up to his own failures or what he deems as failures as a man and as a husband and as a father. And so there's this sense of duty and this sense of... Um, self-redemption to find safety for his family, to do the right thing, to be the leader that he should for his family, to be that rock that he always wanted to be. And I love that because one of the things that, you know, look, this is the second movie I've done with Jerry Butler um, after Angel Has Fallen. And what I love about Jerry is, yes, he's an amazing um, movie star that is known to be the action hero, the known to be the guy in 300, to be Mike Banning in the Has Fallen franchise that I'm very grateful to be now a part of. But John Garrity is a mortal human being. He represents us. And that's what I love about Jerry is Jerry has a, a vulnerability and a sensitivity to him as a, as a man that I think is part of our own masculinity. And he can bring that to the, um, to the table in a way where he's not afraid to show a character that is dealing with real flaws, real trauma, a real atonement of things that he wants to find his own redemption for. And so you get this really honest portrayal of a human being that we can identify to, that we feel relatable to us through the eyes of um, Jerry Butler playing this guy, John Garrity. When I first read Greenland, I knew that there was only one person I wanted to make this movie with to play John Garrity, and that was Jerry Butler. Um, our experience together on Angel Has Fallen was extraordinary and very excited we're about to make a third movie together after this. And, you know, the, the thing about Greenland, it was so striking to me. It was never about a husband and then the sidekick of a, of a wife and a sidekick of a kid. It was really equal value of a husband and a wife and a child. So we knew that the Allison role was extremely important to find this perfect chemistry and pairing with. And we talked about a, a number of actresses, but in the back of my mind, I knew there was only one pick and it was Marina Baccarin. You know, Marina brings such warmth and complexity to her roles. There's a fierceness to her that you would, you would want her on your side if you were in hell and you know, the odds were against you. And yet there's a love and a nurturing that you realize that this movie is not about a husband trying to win his wife back. It is about a husband and wife trying to win their love back and that they both want this marriage to work. They both are dealing with their own consequences, their own um, redemption, finding their own redemption um, of why their marriage was on the rocks and close to failure um, and rekindling their love and also trying to show their young, young boy, you know, at seven years old, what life is about and what really matters. One of my mantras um, in filmmaking is always to put the audience in the character's point of view so they don't feel like they're watching something on the screen, but they're actually participating in it. And we wanted that to be the same thing in Greenland with the action, that you are with the Garrities in their point of view throughout this entire picture. So if you suddenly, and maybe this happens in the movie, you're suddenly in a scene with molten rain coming down and just pelting an entire region, you feel like you're in that vehicle with the Garrities, experiencing it the way you would, almost like an IMAX movie. You're in it with them in a three-dimensional way. And so that's kind of the real conceit of the movie that I love is that 
you're not watching a spectacle from the outside in and just watching a bunch of mindless action. You're actually in the emotional thrust of these characters and witnessing these harrowing situations that they go through and the spectacle in a first-hand point of view with our characters versus being a voyeur and just seeing something on the silver screen. You actually feel like you're participating in the movie as well. We, uh, when we started filming, you, you get into a movie like this and you're trying to make it authentic and real and to really be relatable to people. But again, you're dealing with something that's a hypothetical situation that, yeah, we've had an extinction event on this planet and we're getting nearby misses all the time, right? But still, you want it to feel like, does it, will it resonate with people? And I'll never forget the very first week we were filming, we were filming in this beautiful neighborhood um, in Marietta, Georgia, um, in a real cul-de-sac where real families live and they invited us in, and this is where the Garrities live. And when we shot the scene in the first week where all the families have had this Super Bowl party and they realize it's not a spectacle, it's a monster, and that basically it's now a life or death situation, and the Garrities are leaving the neighborhood, there's this gut-wrenching scene where one of the neighbors has a little girl who has played with their little boy since they were in diapers. They've all known each other. They're, it's the cul-de-sac that we all live on. It's the street that we all live on. It's the neighbors that we've all known and grown up with. And yet, it's this gut-wrenching scene where the Garrities have to turn this little girl away because she wasn't selected for shelter and to leave her behind. It was a very emotional scene to shoot. And I knew we had something, uh, um, something really remarkable. But when I yelled cut, the first AD, Casey Hoddenfield, put his hand on my shoulder and he says, look up the street. And all of the real neighbors were on the, out in the cul-de-sac watching and they were all in tears, crying. And it was an emotional moment for all of us because we knew we had something that could strike a chord and be relatable with many of situations that we would never want to be in. Would you turn away somebody that you knew if, if it was a, a move that would be better for your safety? Um, would you be able to um, put a child in harm's way? Would you be able to kill another human being just in self-defense? These are all the thematic things that happen in Greenland along the way that, yeah, we have this big monster coming in and pelting us from the sky in this big action ride, but there's also this other monster. It's us. It's us as a humanity. Will we turn on each other or will we do the right thing by each other in the end? You know, once you've got your husband and wife in this great pairing of Gerard Butler and Raina Baccarin, now comes the hard, the hard one, right? You have to find a child that can, one, look like it's Jerry's, look like they're Jerry and Marina's kid, and also to perform really adult-themed things at seven years old. And I'm not a really big fan of kids that have been in a lot of things I think sometimes they feel like they're acting and they're reading lines and I wanted to find somebody just a little bit more raw and we just hit gold with this kid, Roger Floyd. Um, what a remarkable young boy at seven years old and his almost like adult world view about things and the way I was able to talk to him about emotional things that were going on, um, he was fantastic and the bond between the three of them was instantaneous. You just saw them all come together and you saw Morena actually acting like a mother to Roger and Roger listening to her as his mother and Jerry playing the father the same thing and having these father and sons talks and just the friction and so forth. But there's some really, really dramatic moments um, for, for, for our young Nathan in this movie and Roger Floyd just does a remarkable job on it. And what I'm proud about it is that it's an honest portrayal, that he was really in these emotional moments. And of course, you know, I'm a father um, of beautiful twin boys, um, and um, I'm always very protective of kids on set and making sure they're in, in never in harm's way. And the family um, of the Floyds were really great and gracious about knowing that we would always protect Roger and keep him in the, in the action, keep him in the drama, but always taking care of him at the same time. When you see a movie like Greenland, um, one of the things that uh, was a daunting task 
was to bring the military aspect to the movie. Um, what you're seeing is the way that we saw in Hurricane Katrina or we saw in other major disasters that a lot of the times we have to rely on the U.S. Air Force to, to mobilize and to get people out of harm's way. And this becomes a national thing as the world is trying to hunker down and figure out how to survive this extinction event. And so in the script, we have the U.S. Air Force mobilizing planes to pick up families at airports and fly them to these secret bunkers in Greenland. And you either fake it, and it's all, all CGI, or you get lucky and you get the United States Air Force to come in and understand what we're making here, and they would just open the doors for us. This is all because of Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Brashear from the U.S. Air Force, who really saw what we were making, um, a movie about humanity, and that we weren't going to characterize the U.S. Air Force, that we wanted to show them as human beings as well, sacrificing their own um, human bodies, um, their own family's safety, to get others out of harm's way. Um, I'm a very big military supporter and a veteran supporter, and what was an amazing experience, and I've had it before, and it was even bigger on this, is they opened up their doors to Robbins Air Force Base um, to us in Warner Robbins, Georgia, and I mean with open arms, and the men and women in uniform that you will see in Greenland are the real thing. We had a few actors, but 95% of the people that you will see in, um, in uniform are real Air Corps from the United States Air Force, and to be out on a tarmac with a billion dollars of aircraft and C-17s and C-10s and fighter jets and the way that they opened their doors to us, the way that the civilians, the citizens of um, Warner Robins, Georgia um, came to, um, um, to play with us is why the movie is a success. I think people understood what it was about and that we were trying to make something about humanity that had a real emotional hook and core to it versus some kind of just trivial thing that's just not one of those, things, those movies where your eyes glaze over. When we were doing research um, for the movie, and I had read the script, we had found out that we do have a number of um, bunkers in the United States. Raven's Rock is one of them. Um, there are others as well that are these secret bunkers to, if there's ever a nuclear fallout or um, a, war, a world war that happened on the US soil, a place that we could protect people, a place we can protect our government, put assets underground. Well, we had found out that there are these secret bunkers um, right outside of Thule Air Force Base on Greenland, the island Greenland. And it w these things have been there since the Cold War. They were built for nuclear fallout. If there was ever um, a nuclear fallout in the United continental United States or some kind of catastrophe, that they can get a number of people to these bunkers. So we kind of took a leap of faith with that and said, well, if you've already been through 9-11 and the Patriot Act has happened, then you can data collect um, on the United States. And if you can data collect, just like we're doing now for COVID-19, then you would understand who people's skill sets are, who they are, the demographics, and so forth. And it became this way for us to understand if you can only save 300,000 people out of 330 million, who would you save? It wouldn't be about the rich. It would be about skill sets. You would pick the doctors, you would pick the scientists, you would pick the military experts, you would be the, you'd, um, you'd pick the, uh, the builders, as in John Garrity, who is a structural engineer. You would need people that, that can resurrect the United States of America and your countries around the world in a unified effort. And so that, we realize this is why the Garritys have been picked, but also we understand that the secret bunkers um, exist um, in Greenland to, be, you know, to bring people to protection. Now, the interesting thing is, with global warming, for the first time, as we were making this movie, the ice thaw has actually melted where you can actually see these bunkers now outside of Thule. We find out that Gerard Butler's character, John Garrity, has been chosen because he's a structural engineer. But what if you were John Garrity and you were the only one on your entire street or any, actually any of your friends that were chosen, that guilt that you would feel, how would you not be able to save them? To go save yourself and the, and, and the survivor's guilt that goes along with that. There are some really interesting themes in this movie that I love that are very human and they're very relatable to things we're going on in this pandemic. Do we act selfless um, and wear masks and 
protect others or do we take our own interpretation of what is right or wrong? I think all of this is um, fair game right now because it's very much what we wanted to do with Greenland. Would you save yourself and were you capable of doing heinous things to save yourself or would you act selfless and save others and risk your own life to, to protect? How would you feel if you were the only one chosen out of all of your friends? Could you say goodbye to them or would you take them with you to even try to make it happen even though you knew it would be a failure? There's all these great themes in the movie that we play with um, that really test one's morality and um, affect us um, as human beings because they're things that we understand and are relatable to us. And that's what I love about this, pic about this picture. What I love about this movie is, yes, it's in the action genre and the disaster genre, but really it's a human story. It's a story about us as mortals, you know, people that aren't bulletproof or superheroes or big action stars. It's about us who we have our own demons, we have our own hardships, our own struggles, things that we're trying to find redemption for. And we get to relate to that through these characters, through these, this family that's on this journey to save themselves, the people they encounter along the way that are either trying to inflict harm on them to save themselves or trying to do the right thing and, and give them safe harbor.